So Florian, have you, uh, did you have a Game Boy? No, um, oh. we only have, um, we have a few um, Nintendo DS here, actually two. I never had a Game Boy, but I know people who had Game Boys. <laughs> did you ever play one of the Legend of Zelda games? Um, not on a Game Boy, to be honest. Um, I was forced to try it now on the on the Switch, but uh, yeah. <laughs> ah, okay. And on the N64, actually. Okay, so you do have like kind of the idea of how one of those games yes. work. Okay. Yes. You pick, you collect stuff so that you can go into new areas and collect more things so that you can achieve your goal. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So uh, lately, I've been playing Link's Awakening on the Game Boy. Uh, well, the Game Boy Color version. I've been playing the DX one. I don't actually have a cart for it, but I bought it on the eShop. It's a rather simple today, rather simple game by today's standards, but one of the scenes in it like hit me in a way that caught me off guard, and I kind of connected to it to the community around open source software. Um, bear with me here. But there is a character in the game named Marin who finds you after you wash up on the shore of Koholand Island when your ship is destroyed at sea in the intro of the game. You learn that she has just one dream. She wants to share her song, The Ballad of the Windfish, with the world. She knows that she is on an island and rather unlikely to leave. But she dreams of sharing the song with the world and sings it to the people around her nonetheless. You've kind of got a feel for the people who are on the island because every time you talk to Marin, she sings the same song. Like every time you talk to this woman, she sings. Which okay. it's just beeping out of the Game Boy Color speaker, but you know. Nevertheless. It as an outsider to the island, though, it didn't really get old to me. As, but as someone who would hear it often, it might get a little grating. Now, later in the game, you find an ocarina, which is a little wind instrument. And if you try to play it, the Game Boy goes, bloop, 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 and then tells you that you don't know how to play an ocarina. But if you talk to Marin after finding the ocarina, she notices and says, oh, that's a beautiful ocarina you've got. And her next question is interesting to me. Would you like to accompany me in my song? Now, if you say yes, then... Um, you and Marin share a moment and play your song together where she sings the first ver first phrase, you play the second phrase, and then it's a duet together for the final one, which is um, far removed from everything you've heard in the game up to that point, especially since there were two voices playing at once in the, through the speaker, mm -hmm. which is pretty, <laughs> pretty advanced for the Game Boy. Um, but just in this game, it's a pretty remarkable scene if you've learned about Marin by talking to her earlier in the game. Because she doesn't ask you first, do you know how to play that ocarina? She only asks if you want to play it with her. And since the question is phrased that way, it's difficult for you to say no. Now at the end of the game, after you leave Koholand, uh, you still know Marin's song. And you're still able to play it and share it with the world. So in a way, you're fulfilling your dream, even though she might never know that. And I think that we could do with more of that in the open source community. You know, many of us dream of sharing our software and ideals with the world. It's kind of what we want to do. I mean, issue number one of UbiPort slash Ubuntu Touch is Ubuntu Touch hasn't taken over the world yet, right? Oh, yes, that was fun to create. <laughs> but what I think we don't realize is that a lot of the time we're singing the same old song to the same old people. Um, when an outsider washes up on our shore with their fancy new gadget, our question shouldn't be, well, do you know how to make that thing work? It should be, do you want to learn more about it? Do you want to mm -hmm. learn how to do it? You know, like I said, Link, you didn't know how to play the ocarina before Marin teaches you. Yeah. And because of that, you're able to share her dream with the world. So be provocative and tell your story. Teach people about what we're doing in the open source world. And if we do that, people are going to share our song for us. That's kind of enablement. And um, with no expectations about what will be the outcome. Mm -hmm. and you have to be confident with such a thing. And you have to be... 
uh, patient with the people that are listening because they might not immediately get what you're saying. You have to repeat a lot of things. You have to be verbose. Um, but in the end, the return will be much more uh, satisfying for us as, as people who know when you finally see that the eyes open and the, the light shines up and somebody says, now I have understood it. And he proves it to you by showing you what he can do with that knowledge. Yeah. <laughs> Which is a basic thing about how how there is fun and 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 value in in uh, teaching other people. Uh? Mm -hmm. So we all should be more like teachers that all know all what they're teaching to the children all the time, and but they do every year or every few years they have again starters with the same thing, and of course it's getting boring to tell always the same how you do things, yeah, uh? but it can be um, very rewarding um, mm -hmm. to see people getting on their own feet. And when we do that kind of thing, people people will share a story with the world for us. They'll yes, they'll fulfill our dream even if we don't know it. We cannot we cannot tell everybody on the world, so we need <laughs> multiplication. And multiplication is that what comes from teaching and from and I'm I'm dragging a bit sidewards now to, to excuse my to excuse already now that comes from also um, a bunch of good documentation. And to be honest, it's a real problem in open source projects that people are not able or unwilling to write comprehensive uh, documentation. Yeah. yeah. Uh, in words yeah, that just... others can understand and follow. And it put, takes so much time, I know. And technically writing is not easy. Yeah? But it's much more rewarding than to just repeat yourself orally again and again. And you see it doesn't stick with the people. Yeah? It's really put interesting it that you took it that way immediately. I think everyone. <laughs> Everyone who I've told that to has taken it a different way. I found it really mm. interesting. Okay. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Ubuntu Touch Q&A, the UbiPorts Foundation show discussing the development of Ubuntu Touch and our community's questions. This is episode 81, streamed live on August 1st, 2020. My name is Dalton, and joining me this week is Florian. Hello, everyone. Hey. Welcome, Florian. Yeah. We've got a lot to talk about this week, um, but it will be a little bit shorter than usual, I think. I think it'll be nice. So let's get let's right see. to it, why don't we? We, we? we can talk ourselves into a, a talking duel, no problem. So we can we can spend more time, but it will be boring for the listeners. So let's keep it straight. <laughs> All right. Let's talk about some things that are new this week, including some new, well, a new cool app that I found on the store. And it is Quickdit which is a Reddit client for Ubuntu Touch, built natively. I was looking at the description uh, and I read it like Quidditch and I was thinking, okay, what is that? What <laughs> is a Reddit client? It's a Again, Reddit client. Reddit. It's a nice client. I really, I'm really enjoying using Quicted. Uh, so, you know, that's pretty cool. I forgot to get the link on the open store. Please bear with me for a moment. <laughs> Just search for Reddit on the open store. We have a nice search function there. You don't have to remember any links. <laughs> Quick it. Quick there it. We are. Double D. <laughs> Oopsies. Um, yeah, I thought that was really cool. You should all check it out if you're Reddit users. Uh, Florian this week has a huge update for one of his apps, though. Oh, yes. Um, finally, Teleport 0 0.8 made it to the open store. We had a few nasty regressions. We still have one bug inside with the with the um, draft function. So if you go back and forth between chats with drafts uh, from here to there, it, you can end up with empty chats uh, still. Um, and uh, yeah, but we said we just ship 0 0.8 now because of two things. The one thing was that it fixes the PinePhone keyboard overlay. There is a subtle bug on, on PinePhone, Wayland, something, something, together with our component, how the keyboard moves in and how the app window needs to resize, and it didn't work properly. So the PinePhone users had a really bad experience with Teleport, so we fixed this now. So nice. everyone on PinePhone, please update. You have now a working um, Teleports client. Cool. Um, the other thing was the upgrade to TDLib 1.6. And because I have one more minute for that, probably, um, everyone who doesn't know how it works, we are taking the code for the core functions of Telegram directly from the Telegram guys in a library that's a client library that talks with the Telegram servers. 
and they are also rushing at a high pace. So we had 1.4 some months ago, now it's 1.6 already. They are trying to put in all the official features there for us to grab and to use or not. So the next thing what will be is we could have um, animated stickers, for example. Um, oh, we so are cool. Yeah, we, we are working on. We, we had a we had a crash now that I didn't see before because suddenly, uh, TDLib supports um, underscores and strike through text, which I never saw on Telegram until I saw the crash. So you can format <laughs> it now on the official <laughs> clients only. We are not there yet that you can actually put this formatting in teleports, but at least it can decode it now properly. So right. TDLib cool. update was a huge thing, and only these two features are now 0 0.8 more or less, minus some small fixes and stuff. I've noticed the it's a lot faster, now. though, too. So it's definitely worth the upgrade. Yeah, it's still, unfortunately, it still crashes sometimes when you have a lot of updates to read. We yeah, really don't find still. this crash, but um, we are on it. And thanks to the guys... Uh, uh, who are doing clickable, it's not possible to debug actually on the device directly with GDB, and you can have nice backtraces, and there you see actually where it's crashing. Yeah? And did I say null pointer D reference? So yeah, that's things that can happen. Yeah? So uh, be a little bit more patient. We are trying to fix the crash bug and some other nasty things, but the next one, 0 0.9, will be nice again, and then I think we are ready to bump it to 1.0 because it's not a beta anymore. I must admit, we kept the beta tag on this app for much too long, and I think we should bring it to an official. <laughs> Time to say it's a real. Huh? Time yeah. to say it's a release. Yeah, it's a release All now. Right. Okay, I will boards. be waiting for that. Oh yes, me too. Mm -hmm. I think you had a device you wanted to talk about this week as well. Oh yeah, um, I'm doing much too much things in my in my free time. <laughs> so I think I was talking already about uh, this guy for some time. Um, that is a. Control. Yeah. Relieve it from his from his shell now to see it Huawei in Nexus beauty. 6P. It's a Huawei Nexus 6P. You can see actually oh, here is Nexus. So 6P, and I learned from the internet, P stands for premium. Yeah? So you're and the boss with this thing. It has a metal case. It is huge. Where is actually? Do I have a fair phone here? Um, comparison in fair phone. You see, fair phone loses. Yeah. But of course, so that's for people who are not afraid of a big phone and it's heavy. I'm carrying this now as a daily driver. I must say it's heavy. <laughs> I didn't expect it in the beginning. You don't skip leg day with the Nexus 6P, yeah. huh? No, no, no. But actually, it's fully working, um, minus camera things that are still a little bit uh, flaky. But um, thanks to Rajanan with his improved GST droid camera, except recording, everything works there. It has the fastest uh, GPS that I have seen for, for any of the devices. It has a fix under 30 seconds. Sometimes it's 10 to 15 seconds. And it's actually rated by independent reviewers. It's rated 70 to 80% completed. So in case you get hold of a Nexus 6, yeah, I have to make a little bit advertisement. It was, Q I asked people in the QA channel, what do you, in the Q&A channel, what I do you think? I remember now, yeah. <laughs> what, what do you think, how much is it worth when it has just these features missing? And the people said, okay, now nah, hotspot I would need, it's only 70%. I said, okay, 70 okay. to 80%, that's All right. it. It should land, it, it's actually, I'm trying to put it in a community channel, um, still the installer and our system image thingy say no, but it's close to that. So, and what else to say? Um, for me, it was just to verify the porting process a bit and to reflect on what I said before. I'm also trying to put more documentation about some things in porting. Yeah? Thank you. Yeah. Because I'm now on the 6P, which is a wonderful device. I can just put the OnePlus One Bacon into the garage and now it will be hooked up and we are preparing there the Halium 7.1 port. So we're still trying to bring the core devices to Android 7.1 pace. Fairphone 2 is already nearly finished. Nexus 5 is in the works. One plus one will start now. Okay. Uh, what else? Um, I think that's it. So just, just celebrate with me that it took months. I don't know when I started working on this. I think it was one year ago or so. But with just working in the free time, it can take some time. Oh, yeah, for sure. So, yes. Um, that was great. Whew. 
And it has the best camera I've ever seen. I can make now pictures that are really nice. Huh? I bet um, the Xperia beats it. <laughs> that can be, sure, because it's just yeah a matter of time. Nexus 6P is already more than four years old. It's already and a five-year-old. So that thing came out in 2015. Yes, I'm five years old. My 5X years. is five years old. Wow. Yeah. It doesn't seem like that long. Anyways, uh, going from the point of uh, what else is going on, I think we have now nearly 40 devices on the devices um, page, right? Yeah. Um, if Who I cares go if here, billions of devices run Java? And um, I, I just I just took the liberty to raise the level of Nexus 6P a bit, the majority. <laughs> but uh, anyways, um, when we look here, uh, for example, there is um, a lot of, of uh, Xiaomi's are ongoing. Um, the OnePlus 3, 3T as usual, Xperia X performance, Xperia X, um, I don't know where to stop. Um, <laughs> our wonderful Vodafone, Moto G, something. I heard a Moto G 5 port is now in the works. Yeah, there's a um, lot of devices ongoing right now. LG, G6, V20. Very interesting stuff. So in case there was a, there was a short question in the chat, will we add new devices? Well, yeah, as I said already, there are a lot of people trying to port things. I think that's really, I don't know, 500% more than last year. <laughs> at least it's a lot a lot yeah <laughs> speaking of things that you can install ubuntu touch on and are on the devices page how about the pine phone Ooh, uh, there it is again uh we didn't cover this last time because there's just so much to talk about with the manjaro guys but the pine phone post market os community edition is up for sale now you're able to purchase this wonderful device uh, with two gigabytes of RAM and 16 gigabytes of storage for $150 plus shipping and customs. Or there's a three gigabyte of RAM and 32 gigabyte of storage version available for $200 plus shipping and taxes or customs. The, um, I'm very interested in seeing the three gigabyte of RAM version, um, but this mm. device will come with PostMarket OS, and by purchasing it, you are supporting the PostMarket OS developers uh, to the tune of ten dollars a device. However, once you get it, if you like, you can install Ubuntu Touch on it either by writing the image to the SD card or by writing it to internal storage, depending on what you want to replace or how you want to boot it. And you can try out all sorts of different operating systems, whether you have the existing uh, UbiPorts Community Edition, or you have a Braveheart, um, or you're going to have this new post-market Community Edition. Yeah, I think that that's the, the, the interesting thing about it, that now the Community Editions will mix in the communities. So people that bought our Community Edition are probably going to refresh another OS. Uh, people that want to want to touch are now buying post-market. There is a logo on the back. They, um, But that's, that's kind of a spirit here to say, okay, we are all in the same boat and uh, we are helping each other. So why not? Mm -hmm. eh? And some people were asking us uh, kind of, aren't you disappointed that this edition has now an option for more RAM and storage and hardware, blah, blah, blah. And I said, no, we are not because it's a continuous evolution. How can we say that we, we should get, have gotten this benefit? No, uh, by all means, no, we're just, we're so early because we had our ass in a shape that we said, okay, we, we could ship this, huh? but still it's a great thing that this develops further on. And I mean, that's technology today. You, you're never going to have, the perfect thing in front of you, and now it's finished. It's just yeah, you're not something future. you can improve. Yeah, yeah, that's it. So we are, we appreciate this, and uh, we are fully behind the post-market guys, of course. We have a lot of good friends there also. Um, if you want to support them, just buy this thing. No, no worries. Mm -hmm. It's not about us against anybody else. Uh, right. Well, I mean, it is kind of us against the big platforms, but... You know, yes, on this micro of level too. of all the open source operating systems, yeah. we're not trying to steal users from each other. That's just if silly. we would do this, that would be really harmful for us because then they would also yeah. start trying to steal from us, and in the end, it's just a usual struggle between everyone against them. And we, we have and to then unite we take bit, on the people who are actually yes needed. Um, let's see. What else? Uh, oh yeah, the 32 gig version, the convergence edition. It's called. 
includes a USB Type-C dongle, which has HDMI, 10 100 Ethernet, and uh, USB ports. So that is a pretty cool cell, too. And that'll come in the box with your 3 gigabyte edition, not the 2 gigabyte RAM edition. Hope that made sense. Um, forgot to put the link to that in live chat, but it is in the video description because I planned ahead. Yeah, that's good. Now it's in the in it. Can you can you uh, highlight it for? Because it's it just doesn't a make so cool sense. Feature. It doesn't um, <laughs> okay. Other things. Mm. Pine tab. This is the old version, but you know. Um, Pine64 has posted an update on the shipping progress of the Pine tab. So we're going to see, hopefully, the third full week in August, we'll see them shipping. Everything going well. And uh, otherwise, it's it's really fun to see improvements happening to the Pine phone directly benefiting the Pine tab with Ubuntu Touch. Um, because they're basically the same hardware. You just lopped the um, LTE modem off of the tablet. It's pretty cool. Um, but at the same time, each one has its own quirks. Um, developing for the Pine phone, some things that are kind of coming down the pipe include GPS support, which is supposed to be working in the development images, but appears not to for all users or on all boots. It's not reliable. I hate that. Um, and uh, there was one other thing that came up this week. Oh yeah. Uh, Rachanan is doing some work on the camera, getting some work in on GStreamer as he does uh, working in GStreamer land now with the Pine phone a little bit more. So um, I'm not going to make promises on timelines for that. You know what happens when I do that. I get shot. Um, <laughs> so unfortunately not able to do that, but it is forward progress. Maybe two short answers for the for the live chat. The one is GPS when. Um, I would say, unfortunately, still nobody put the middleware in. So it's there. It's yeah. not working right. I'm upset about that. <laughs> that's the thing. All of these bugs genuinely upset me, but I really should. They really shouldn't because that's just making me less able to work on them. Yeah. Don't let you be upset by the bugs. The second one is Volte when. So. I read about this, I think, um, was it a blog or Twitter post? Um, Other distributions which use Modem Manager are apparently able yeah. to use or make voice calls using voice over LTE on the Pine phone. Yeah. I'm not sure what would need to be changed in a phono to make it do the same thing. I'm not sure why you need to make changes in a phono to make it do the same thing. It just seems really silly. It seems like something the modem should handle itself. Anyway. Um, yeah. <laughs> so it's not there. Um, it has to send some AT commands. We have to put it in somewhere. We don't know where. Uh, but at least we have a document that explains what we need to do. That's already much if you think about other things where we have no clue what we need, would need to do. Right. So it, it would be probably easy if someone would grab a branch of a phono or uh, a fork and just see where he can squeeze it in. Yeah, cannot mm -hmm. be that hard. I mm -hmm. the <laughs> <laughs> That's gonna be easy. <laughs> uh, given it's over the QMI protocol, which is entirely undocumented. It's an interesting thing to work on, no doubt. Anyway, that is the Pine Phone. We have some community projects that have been going on by Kaizen. Uh, who has been trying to better engage the community to, you know, to get people who maybe are on the fringes now more involved, to get the people who are involved more um, on the same page, and similar things to that. So he actually has three stories going on right now, three projects. Um, one of them is his branding project, which is to fix the branding around the Ubiports Foundation and Ubuntu Touch, the operating system to fix how we say the value proposition of Ubuntu Touch is laid out and to distinguish the foundation from the operating system a bit more. And to say, you know, this is community, this is foundation where that needs to happen. And then to align the strategies both for the community and the foundation, which so far hasn't been a huge issue, but to just be able to communicate that that is the case is hugely important. 
so that it would be clear for anyone who's coming in just from outside or you know stumbling upon our web pages to say okay that's their mission that's how they're achieving it his next his next project is building the ubuntu touch website which is a site for developers users and general contributors to have one place to understand ubuntu touch from a high level overview so that it's easy to navigate between documentation and resources for that which is being done with the community and then a ubiports foundation website uh, which is for manufacturers hardware communities um, and just the general like high purpose style marketing strategies people with privacy concerns or concerns about the next generation of technology in general um, and people who might want to donate to the Ubiports Foundation so they can all get the information that they need. And that's primarily being done more with the foundation board that he's working on. So all of that is to say there are a few things that if you're not a developer who knows how to work on these, you'll be able to help us with right now. So if you're one of those people... <laughs> Purpul, who has been asking, how do I get involved with Ubuntu Touch? Here's a great place to do it. One thing that we would really like to have is people who can write good English. Um, you know, a lot of the people who are working on these projects don't have English as their first language. So it's hugely important to be able to have copywriters in this regard who can um take ideas that might not be written in English, might be written more like porch English um, or Spinglish um, and actually translate them into idiomatic um, English. So a huge help would be from people who are willing to copyright, which is right, not, um, you know, you, you get it, I'm sure. <laughs> Another thing that would be helpful is for people who might be front-end web developers um, who know Bootstrap or the vanilla framework, Vue, um, or other CSS frameworks. I mean, it all kind of bunches together at some point. Um, we need a lot of help from people who can do that as well because we'd like to, you know, make a nice, convincing, good-looking website for people to land on and find these um, resources. So I will post the link to that in the description. And actually it might be in the description already. If it's not, it will be after the show. Where you can go get in contact with Kaizen and maybe help him out with that. One other thing that you can do, and this would be helping me directly more than Kaizen, even though I do like him and he's really nice and <laughs> I've loved working with him so far. Um, if you want to help me, Florian, uh, Marius a little bit more um, differently, you can help us triage bugs. So especially you people out there who have the Pine phone, who maybe are just receiving it now or have received it. We need a lot of help with people who can confirm bugs on the Pine phone tracker or watch the Ubuntu Touch Tracker, confirm bugs there if you have other devices like, you know, Nexus 5, Meizu Pro 5, anything else that has a 5 in it, or a 4 in it. Seems like all of them do, except for the M10. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and there is one thing that is upcoming still. It's not finished, but we are working on a specific uh, homepage, web page, whatever system, where you can more easily uh, test and... and um, summarize the results of any tests for right, each device. Right, for more of a QA kind of um, thing. And that's kind of, it's, it's, it's no a QA refreshing. tool. Yeah. yeah. So that will launch in, in somewhere in autumn, as I understood, Jan, or uh, hopefully this year still. Yeah. So autumn is a long time. <laughs> but uh, it will be then much easier for everyone to run structured tests because you have to test cases there, more or less, what you need to do. And you just input the results. And that can be quite quickly. You can do it in one go for one device, a few of those lists. You don't have to do everything, of course. We are not mm -hmm. uh, doing uh, putting you into jail for that. But every small piece will come together. So the more people test uh, and uh, verify the results on a, on a wider scale, the, uh, the more stable we can make our devices in the end. 
Yeah. Currently, we rely more about um, people who do this um, when they feel like, but we need to do it a little bit more on a, on a cycle. Mm -hmm. And that means uh, we said, OK, uh, it would be great to have such a tool. And this is still in the works, but it looks really promising. I already saw the prototype. It's really easy to handle. You don't spend a lot of time with typing or so, just testing results, and that's it. Yeah. Right. But for bugs that are just things that are coming up in any of the issue trackers, I need a lot of help from people who are willing to, you know, confirm bug reports or, you know, say to um, people who are reporting, hey, this might not be the right place for this. Ping me if anything needs to be moved. Um, put labels on things, especially. Um, we've been missing labels. We've got a lot of needs confirmation things. There's just a lot of cruff in our bug trackers right now that I've been trying to clear through and sort through. But it's been a really long progress for process yeah. for me. So, if anyone would like to help out with that, I am at Universal Superbox on Telegram. PMs are open, but please don't say hello. Please say that you're trying to get a hold of me about that thing. Because if you just say yeah. hello, I will might think that you're a scammer. Because I've had a lot of people contact me who are scamming me so <laughs> lately. Hello, we are in a mutual group together. Which group? Um, um, okay. Yeah, there anyway. are. Around 550 bugs and issues open in the tracker now, and some of them are really, really old. They date back to 2017, and usually a bug that is older than a certain amount of time needs a complete re-verification if it's still applicable, if still if it got worse, if it got better. Mm -hmm. um, so we really want to get rid of this, all these unconfirmed and aged things if we can because yep. it will make our focus much better. Every yep. time I look at this number of 550 open tickets, I think, okay, God, when we will burn through this, yeah, but maybe they're just all invalid. Yeah? <laughs> Which no, is, of course, not there's true, plenty yeah, of valid ones, but it's um, one thing at a time. You know? Yeah. I mean, take it slow. People can work on it whenever they want. I can just get you added to the repository. You'll be able to put labels on issues and help us out with that. It'll be... Yeah. It's a huge help to have people who are just looking at the bugs saying, that sounds like a bug that's already filed and saying, hey, this is a duplicate of this. Even just people doing that is a huge help for me. Yeah. All right. Definitely. Speaking of people who are helping us out, thank you to our uh, UBports Foundation sponsors, including our gold, platinum, sorry, forgot the Forgot the precious metal sponsors, Smooze, Vala, Pine64, and Private Internet Access, who are making it possible for us to create Ubuntu Touch. You know, we have people who are actually paid to do this, and it's just amazing. And also a huge thanks to our community sponsors, including Laurentine Tilleman, Rana Mirkalev, George Toma, Michael Dale Meyer, A. Thiel. Max Fielder, James H. Jackson Jr., Casey Lambie, Darren Olson, Nathan Thomas, and Glenn Hancock. All of you are making it possible for us to create Ubuntu Touch. If you want to join those people so I can mispronounce your name every week, every two weeks as well, you can head over to patreon.com slash ubiports. Or if you'd just like to help us out in any other way, and really, any amount is really helpful, we appreciate it. You can head over to ubiports.com slash donate. Again, you're making it possible for us to well, do these shows every two weeks for one thing, but also make an operating system that people genuinely love and we love to make. So thank you. Thank you. Just a little reminder, Patreon has started charging sales tax. So if that applies to you, it should have started applying this month. Just so you know, make sure that all your charges are right and you'll be good to go. All right. Good. Question time. Yeah. Right. We take these questions from our forum every two weeks. Uh, the forum thread is usually posted on the Monday before the show, unless I don't get the link to Nigel, in which case it's normally posted on Tuesday or Wednesday. <laughs> Go me. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's okay. So, WBPTM. I will never know how to pronounce your name, unfortunately. Maybe you can tell us uh, phonetic speech thingy. Uh, wants to know, unfortunately, the Volophone doesn't have notification leads. A great lack for all those who like this mechanism like me. And I think this mechanism is part of the soul of UT. Do you envisage a workaround, for example, by playing with the screen and its lightning? 
Okay. So, of course, Vala, again, is one of our sponsors, and they have sent a number of phones to our developers. And it's a device that will be shipping with Ubuntu Touch, just for that recap, in case anyone um, didn't know. It'll be shipping with Ubuntu Touch or their own uh, Vala operating system. Recap there. Interesting that it doesn't have notification LEDs. Um, I should be receiving mine soon. I think it's cleared customs finally after weeks. Uh, <laughs> I know it's a dangerous time for them too, so they're getting through it as much as they can. So I won't say too much about that, but um, interesting that it doesn't have notification LEDs. What we do have now is your screen will light up when you receive notifications, but of course that doesn't happen long term. Now on Android, there are, well, actually all devices now will light up the screen when um, it detects generally significant motion or significant noise or something similar. It depends on every device. And it'll light up the screen to show you if you have any notifications. I think that would be something rather interesting to do with Ubuntu Touch as well. But of course, there's always the question of time. So um, I'd say for the release of the Volophone, just plan on it having um, the screen lighting up when you have notifications and then going back to sleep, you know, right when the notification comes in. But otherwise, there won't be some alternative to the notification LED at that time. And one more small question from live chat. Will the product be only available in USA? I'm not quite sure if it's about the Volophone, which um, is meant by product here. I don't think the Volophone but, is available. Um, the Volophone is actually made in Germany, and there will be kind of international shipping options, I think. However, not in all the countries, at least not from the beginning. Um, yeah. Uh, also take care that it works with your provider in US because I know this is still weird with CDMA and all the other stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Dr. Wurzer has been very interested in knowing how the US networks work on the Volophone. He has been emailing me like every week. Do you have it yet? Have you tested out on the US networks? It's like, no, I'm sorry. I don't have it yet. <laughs> Thank you so much, but I, I don't have it yet. Please give me some more time. <laughs> Please, customs is slow. Yeah. You have yeah. to forgive. I mean, it's a product from Germany. It can be dangerous for the US market. <laughs> the competition is like that. If you if there is something coming from outside, just try to hold it off. Yeah? <laughs> try to stop it from entering US. That's the safest way. Yeah. Okay. Right. Sorry. We're going we're going something, too much something politics. TikTok. Okay, now we're off yeah. the rails. <laughs> Rick. Rick, I have understood from previous QA sessions that some of the major development goals include moving to system D, moving 24 base, moving to Wayland. Any updates on these goals and how they interrelate system D, for example, we heard briefly from Marius, went better than expected when working on Lumiri for Manjaro ARM. Oh, that's a twisted question. So basically, what is the news about the building blocks we want to have mm -hmm. soon after 13, OT 13 maybe? Right. So as far as these things go, as um, Marius mentioned last week, getting on other operating systems, Debian, Arch, Manjaro, um, Fedora. Getting things packaged for all these distributions means we find the issues that we have with newer software. So, um, for example, even newer versions of Evolution Data Service, which stores calendars and contacts and things, can cause issues with our older software. So finding all those issues on other operating systems is hugely important. And indeed, that process kind of helps with all of the things that you've mentioned, moving to 2004, moving to System D, moving to Wayland. All of these things are helped by the projects we're doing today. Um, and a lot of Mars's focus at the moment is on those projects and fixing those things up, interestingly enough. Not directly 2004 yet, but a lot of similar things. And a lot of... Um, foundation laying things for 2004. Like, for example, switching up our Debian repository management so that we're actually able to build and sign devs without waiting 40 minutes for the entire repository to rebuild every time. <clears throat> and similar things like that. There are also other projects that are happening more di directly for us and things that we are um, sponsoring people to work on, like 
uh, our upgrade of Qt from 5.9 to 5 to 5.12, um, which is going to be hugely important because Ubuntu 20.04 ships Ubuntu 5. Dot, ships Qt 5.12.8. So being on 5.12 in our version means that it'll be easier to move to 20.04 when the time comes for that. Indeed, yeah. some of these things go better than expected and some of them go worse than expected. I won't, again, not a good time to give a timeline. It's just this iterative process that is uh, continuously moving forward. Yep. Here's a second question, actually. Um, how will other distros like Mobian be able to uh, use Ubuntu Touch click apps? Would they effectively need a different packaging format? Will UT itself eventually move away from click, or is the hope that more will adopt click format? Okay. We, so there was a little bit of discussion beer, about this. <laughs> there was a little bit of discussion about this last week that I actually cut out from the final show because it just, there were connection issues and just bleh, it was no good. Um, I'm not going to throw my hat in on any particular packaging format for Ubuntu Touch, but I think the main part of this question is, can we use Ubuntu Touch apps on other platforms? Which for one, thank you, that means that our apps are good and you actually want them on other platforms. Um, that is the sincerest form of flattery. The thing is that apps will need to be built as different packages um, for other distributions. I don't think that any distribution will accept um, Click being packaged for it. And indeed, there are many things that Click does that are rather tightly integrated into Ubuntu Touch. Not necessarily the Click packaging format itself. The packaging format itself doesn't care what it's running on. But the applications and the hooks inside of Click packages do rely on things that are only available on Ubuntu Touch and system level features that are only available there. So... Um, it's not exactly like, go. Yeah, no, it's just a small example would be permissions for the apps. Um, uh, we have, I don't know, something like uh, positioning or, or uh, location information, audio, video, whatever, that are um, claims in a manifest file that you need to specify. And all the distributions would need to understand this uh, um, from the others that they are. That right, that's one of those so, click hooks is the app armor yeah, hook that they, creates app armor profiles so that apps can't access anything that they aren't explicitly allowed to yeah. in their own manifest. And then again, by the user, um, depending on the thing that's being accessed, like microphone and location, you will be asked specifically before the app accesses them. Yeah, and that's the point. So that's highly uh, unlikely that all the other uh, distributions would understand exactly that format and do the things in the same way. And in the other way, also, if other apps would come to our platform, we wouldn't understand their concept. So that's already kind of um, yeah, forked into various directions. So uh, there is no standard for this. Uh, packaging format is one thing, and system uh, interfaces is another a little bit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And the packaging format is really a small part of what makes Ubuntu Touch interesting it's more the integration the hooks and everything around it so in order to use our apps on other platforms they would probably need to be packaged in a different packaging format but more importantly they would need to learn to use um different interfaces for the same features that they get on a bunch of touch And that doesn't mean that everything need, uh, runs unconfined by default uh, without any security. We don't want to have this like, oh, there comes yeah, a package. I don't understand it. I give you all the permissions that you want, uh, or I give you everything what I have. Uh. So, so that's no, not. No. We don't want to make it more insecure than it is. Uh. <laughs> Oops, <laughs> did I say insecure? Um, oh my! Let's I see. wrote down a few small things here from live chat. One thing is things after OTA thirteen. Skyrush7 wanted to know what are we looking forward or excited about after OTA 13. Well, I think Qt 5.12 is already something we can be excited about. Um, and um, yeah, there are a lot of other promising things. I think um, it will be an interesting autumn and um, um, second half of the year upcoming after the holiday season has ended maybe. Um, so... I think we really we will update the tracker sooner 
um, when we are close to OT13, and then you can take a look again on one of our projects on GitHub repository. But yeah, not mm -hmm. specifically hyped about. I mean, Qt 5.12 will be cool. Mm -hmm. I yeah, it's it's difficult for me to get hyped about. <laughs> it sounds sad, but it's difficult for me to get hyped about specific things right now because there's just such a huge breadth of things that I'm trying to worry about. I have a lot of pots in the air, so getting specifically excited about anything that I'm going to put in the update after the one I'm currently working on is a little difficult. Um, yeah, we feel you, Dalton. We feel you. <laughs> yeah. So oh. basically, I think it's going to be another update of things that are ready because they're ready, not because yeah. we, um, we had this huge plan for them before. Uh, question from the forum. I need to bring this larger. Why is this so small? Zoom. Greetings from India, from Bast PT. I'm eagerly following most of Ubuntu Touch, UB ports, and PinePhone news and developments. Thank you. I'd like to bring in a design question or proposal where the current launcher bar is always visible by default, which is good on a laptop or desktop. But as a mobile phone interface, that design occupies some, occupies some real screen real estate and as a result, the whole phone looks like a lesser width. Is it possible to only show maybe the bottom left icon by default, and then when clicking on that, the other icons are visible? So this way, the whole phone looks better and more coherent. So I don't know if you're just going off of um, screenshots online, Bast, but the launcher on the side of the phone is only available when there are no apps running, or is only sat on the screen when there are no apps running. Otherwise, you can call it specifically um, when an app is running, but generally it's hidden from view. Oops. That didn't sound so good. So if you have no apps running, it is on screen. But as soon as you launch an app, it does hide itself. And you're able to bring it back by swiping from the left. I do agree with you. If it was on screen all the time, it would be a bit of a waste of space. Um, Somebody already said he wants to look at his background without a disturbing launcher bar. So yes, I mean, there could be an option for that to, to I don't know, hide it automatically also when there is no app running and so on and so on. Currently, there's not problem, more focus. You uh, don't want people to yeah. hide it and then not know where to go, especially well, when they're new to the, to the system. Yeah, of it's course. Just, no, it should. It, it, no, no default, of course. Yeah, but it's one of those things that I probably for, would merge if it had tests. You yeah. know. If someone yeah. made it, it had tests to make sure that it's always out when it's supposed to be and it's always gone when it's not supposed to be. I don't really want to fight the battle anymore. It yeah. seems like a silly battle for me to have ever fought in the first place, but it's more so the tests making sure that it never gets hidden, stays hidden at the wrong time. And then it's all right. People can have Zen mode. I, it makes sense. So, a few small things still from live chat. React Native, question mark. Oh, my, forgive me for, for mispronouncing the name. Ulatimir wants to know if there's a React Native option on Ubuntu Touch. Uh, well, not really. Mm. Yeah, I don't think there is a native exporter for React Native. Or at least if there was at one point, there isn't anymore. There might be experimental things. However, Ubuntu Touch does have a, just a web app container and HTML5 apps that you can just run something like React on. Now, React Native does not have, again, any hooks for Ubuntu Touch that would make it able to use the native features. Um, but it should be available as an option because I'm pretty sure React Native is HTML5 apps. Hmm. And that has been a thing on Ubuntu Touch before and can be again. It was with Cordova. That it support us since we oh, from Cordova, Cordova. however. It was a nice time. It was <laughs> there for one month. I loved it when it was there. It was longer than that because, well, it was longer. After yeah, yeah, we sure. got it, they dropped it. <laughs> yes. Because, you know. So, Conrad wants to know make animation, if it's possible to make animations shorter. Unfortunately, I'm not sure which animations you mean. Is it about transition animations from um, moving between apps, swiping, or having the launcher flying in, or um, is it just something else? You have to explain a little bit your question. Then we can come to your second one while you're working on the first one again. Fingerprint sensor on the Volophone, does it work? 
Yes. Um, I think so. Yep. Yeah. Should be. Yeah. yeah. Jan was talking about that a couple episodes ago. He was very happy with it. In fact. Yes, true. He was like, oh, look, it's working. Yeah. While, he was, while he was being um, absorbed by the angels or whatever. Yes, yes. <laughs> Um, just saying, because I can, again, segue to my Nexus 6P, there is also fingerprint sensor here. It's now a Helium 7 one device. And because of the nice work of Erfan for the Helium 9 uh, and the Volophone and so on and so on, we might spin up an experiment also to bring that one back to the older port. So also that fingerprint sensor could start working one day. No timeline, no promises, but um, yeah. That might also help the old, help the old Meizu Pro 5 with the fingerprint sensor. Hard Just to say. say. I, I doubt, but... Um, <laughs> and then, of course, everyone's going to ask about Mr. Xperia X. No, it does not work there yet. Yeah. Um, let's see. Uh, let me... I found one. It's gone. Oh, Conrad has replied to us. I'd like to know about general animations. Android has a way to disable all of them in developer settings. Yes. It does. We do not have any feature like that. However, I kind of like, you know, a reduced motion mode for Ubuntu Touch. It just doesn't exist yet. And again, it would need to be mm. tested and integrated in a way that it could just yeah. be well done. Because I don't want things to just be done halfway, right? Um, True. Yep. And, yeah. <laughs> that Geo guy on the forum says... Hi all, I'm new to this community. Thanks in part to the PinePhone UV Ports Community Edition. Will we ever see clickable desktops supporting ARM64 machines? Mm hmm, that's interesting. I believe it can now build on ARM64 machines. I might be wrong there, but I'm pretty sure I saw that news fly by. That you can now build Ubuntu Touch apps from your PinePhone Pro. Um, but I don't think clickable desktop works there yet. It's probably something that they'd like to see someone work on and contribute. Um, and that'd be really nice. People who have those devices are the most helpful in getting things like that working. So next questions. What are the expectations for moving Wayland, moving to Wayland on Ubuntu Touch? Is it expected to eventually make Lomiri faster in terms of responsiveness or enabling GPU acceleration? And what do app developers have to worry about in terms of switching over? First, there's already GPU acceleration for apps in Ubuntu Touch. Um, all of uh, every device has GPU acceleration for the apps through OpenGLES on everything. Even the Pine Phone. The reason why the Pine Phone description says that it doesn't have video acceleration is because it doesn't have video playback acceleration. Florian, we should edit that. You know what? That's caused enough confusion. Why didn't I just edit it? My bad. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Um, I experienced the same for other for other devices as well. Even for myself, I was asking a question last time. What is now missing? Video acceleration? It's written GPU acceleration, blah, blah, blah. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Sometimes confuse yourself. Is it expected to make Lomiri faster in terms of responsiveness? I maybe any work that would be done there, anything that would make Lomiri more responsive in that way would be a result of improvements made as part of the process to move to Wayland and not just moving to Wayland on its face. Switching out mere client for Wayland doesn't automatically give us performance benefits necessarily. And Rodney again is correcting us. Of course, it's the decoding thing that is missing because acceleration of the output and rendering of the stuff on the screen is not an issue. Right. Um, it's, it's always the playing an MP4 part. file that's 4K on a device that should never be able to do that. Yes. And that's basically eating up all your battery and CPU in one second. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so you get a nice frame, but it's only actually 60 frames or 50 frames per second, and then you're done. <laughs> <laughs> so you get 50 frames yeah it is one of those things that i'd really like to see on the pine phone but um i don't know how much work is being done for that um from any community at the moment it might be one mm -hmm. of those things that's rather late game and your final question what do app developers have to worry about in terms of switching over to wayland uh there shouldn't be anything if there is it's probably a bug and please let us know that your app broke on the Pine phone and nowhere else. 
Yeah. Because that is something that's interesting to know. Um, let us know. That's again something for smoke testing, which we have on various devices. So it should come up automatically that something is broken on the pine phone only on that device and we can triage it then somewhere. But uh, yeah, we are quite okay. not there. A couple more from live chat and then we will finish up. Yep. Oh, were there any more from live chat? You didn't write anything down. No, but I, I, uh, I take again from Conrad. He um, well, is again asking about uh, how we got the fingerprint working uh, on the Walla and if it's on Halium. Yes, it's on Halium. Um, I don't know if it's GSI or, or a specific one. Um, because there are, for Android 9 there, we have done two things. This question specifically is about whether or not it's documented. And I don't yeah. believe... No, it's, it's not on the Holium documentation. It might be on the porting wiki that Nikita has created. So just ask about yeah. that in the Holium group. That'll be a better place to direct these questions than us because we're slower than the Holium group most of the time. <laughs> New reports porting, Holium porting. Please come to Telegram and we talk about this. Um, docs for Holium 9, same thing. What I said in the beginning when we are pondering and philosophing around. <laughs> yeah, documentation is an important part. And unfortunately, we are completely dropping the ball here on some corners, like giving a consistent porting documentation or difference documentation. What's different for Halium 9 in contrast to what we have on the other portings? Because 5.1, 7.1 was quite pretty, what was quite straightforward for some things and not much different. Android 9 might have a few special pieces that need documentation. Yeah. <laughs> we are behind. And... I'm sorry. Okay. Finally, Rick has a question leading back to his prior questions involving um, main development goals and other distributions using Ubuntu Touch apps. Flip side of that question about other distros using click packages. What about other pa operating systems packages on Ubuntu Touch, like GNOME Lib Handy apps? Will they only work through Libertine? Will they be performant? Or will they just not run well? If these things are packaged for Ubuntu Touch, and to take advantage of um, the features in Ubuntu Touch, they'll run. But they need to be packaged as clicks at the moment, and they need to accept the um, both the limits on developers on the platform and any differences in how the software is built, including the much older um, 1604 base at the moment. So in theory, these things should work. In practice, no one has tried it yet. You would need to do things like in um, including GTK, the entire GTK build, and libhandy in your package. So it wouldn't be an easy thing, but it is possible, given enough work. I feel like we should do a frequently asked questions kind of thing on that, because it is a question that we get a lot. All right, I think that will do it. Any questions about PinePhone uh, stuff? We have questions about specific hardware stuff on the PinePhone. You should definitely join us in at UT on Pine on Telegram. It's an excellent place to talk about the PinePhone. There are people who can't, and to answer your specific question, there are people who can make calls, but it's still buggy. That's another thing that I really hate. I don't like that. I want it to work great. And I try hard, but we'll get there eventually. Yeah. All true. right. Let's finish it up. So, mm -hmm. uh, how do I finish these things? <laughs> well, you read the text uh, that you have prepared some three years ago. Um, and um, you can find us on Twitter, Mastodon. Stuff. All right. All right. I got you. I got you. <laughs> Just please stop. <laughs> Thank you everyone so much for watching this episode of the Ubuntu Touch Q&A. It's been excellent. It's good to have you all here. Uh, you can find us on many social medias, including Facebook, Twitter, PixelFed, Mastodon, LinkedIn, Instagram, Diaspora. And if you want our news directly in your chat client, you can find us on Telegram or Matrix News Channel. All of these things are linked down in the video description. You can also chat with us on Matrix or Telegram at UbiPorts or hash UbiPorts on the respective platforms that need that. We also have a forum at forums.ubports.com, which is an excellent place for longer form content. Or if you want to get in touch with people like Kaizen on his um, marketing or communications projects, 
He's in the design and marketing incubator sections mostly. Again, huge thank you everyone for joining us this week, and we will see you all in the next one. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.